session of the Global Economic Policy Forum 2023 brought to you by CII in association with the Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance, Government of India. May I please request you, ladies and gentlemen, to please join me in extending a very warm and hearty welcome to our chief guest, Shrimati Nirmala Sitaramanji, Honorable Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs, Government of India. We are extremely privileged and honored at the same time to have Honorable FM's gracious presence on this occasion. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome our Honorable FM Shrimati Nirmala Sitaramanji. Madam, an extremely warm welcome to you to this program. Thank you for your presence here. Also joining us on stage, ladies and gentlemen, we have Mr. Ricardo Hosman, Rafiq Hari, Professor of the Practice of International Political Economy and founder and director of Harvard Growth Lab from the Harvard Kennedy School. We have with us Mr. R. Dinesh, President of CII, and Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee, Director General of CII. Ladies and gentlemen, with these words, I would like to now invite Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee, DGCII, requesting him to kindly make the welcome address and then kindly take this session forward. The Honorable Minister for F Finance and Corporate Affairs of the Government of India, Srimati Nirmala Sitaramanji, Dr. Ricardo Hausman, the Founder and Director of Harvard Growth Lab, Harvard Kennedy School of the Harvard University, President of CII, Mr. Dinesh, Excellencies, very, very distinguished participants from across the world, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a very warm welcome to all of you to this uh, inaugural session of uh, the CII Global Economic Policy Forum 2023. And uh, such an honor, pleasure for having with us to inaugurate this, our Honorable Finance Minister, who's shared this, who's given us this idea to do this uh, uh, forum to involve the world. And this comes, as you all know, close to the heels of a great and a successful India's presidency of the G20. And I just wanted to start by very specially and warmly welcoming our Honorable Minister to our midst and also to congratulate her for her phenomenal and astute management of uh, the macroeconomic management, if one can say, which has resulted in a strong set of GDP growth numbers for the second quarters, which has exceeded the market uh, expectations in all of us. <laughs> Madam Minister, you saw how spontaneous that was. And uh, we really value your leadership, your involvement, and always your participation uh, with the industry. And we have seen you across the world. And it's great to have yourself involved with this, with the journey of the Indian industry, whenever we come and cry on your shoulders, you, you really have solutions always uh, 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 for us. May I now also turn to another very distinguished uh, professor. Professor was speaking to us just a little while back, Dr. Ricardo Hausman, and uh, the, uh, the, the way you, are, you presented to us uh, the entire model uh, and your perspective was indeed most, most, most insightful. And uh, as an institution, an Indian industry, we look forward to staying engaged with you. And a very, very warm welcome to you, Dr. Hausman. Thank you very much for being with us here. On behalf of CII, I'd also like to really take this opportunity to welcome each one of you to 
this uh, very, very important forum. As you all see, the response that we have received is uh, un unbelievably and uh, very, very strong. And uh, while we have six different tracks that we are going to discuss over today and tomorrow, and uh, as our team in, uh, sums it up, we, the six tracks would really be on the economic growth, global cooperation, digital transformation, climate action, inspiration from India, and gender parity. And we have, besides, of course, Indian industry, global industry, think tanks, academia, policymakers, all involved in this process over today and tomorrow. We'll have more than 60 policymakers, including uh, global experts from across. So we really look forward to a very, very exciting today and tomorrow and look forward very strongly to the inaugural session and our honorable finance minister's address. With that, I'd like to once again welcome each one of you to this conclave and to request you to participate most enthusiastically. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. May I now request uh, Mr. R. Dinesh, the president of CII, to give some industry perspectives uh, given the backdrop of this summit. Honorable Finance Minister, Professor, CB, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, let me add my very warm welcome to all of you for the inaugural session of the CIA Global Economic Policy Forum 2020. For the inaugural session, and it is befitting that you are joining us today as this unique forum is going to serve as a platform for thought-provoking discussions on making sure that we are able to solve or resolve in the best manner possible the contemporary global economic challenges which we all face. We are aware of your passion and how you have championed the Indian industry's economic agenda, and we thank you for that encouragement and leadership. We are indeed grateful that you have consented to chair this forum, and we look forward that we, under your leadership to scale up this forum to become the voice of the Global South going forward as well. We know that you are coming out of Parliament today, so once again, a very special thanks for joining us and really appreciate that. I think in the B20, we managed to, I would call it, create a roadmap for many of the points which can become the bedrock for a building consensus with developing and developed nations. As we look at satisfying the basic requirements, we then believe that what are the best solutions which can be built, whether it is for health, education, or the economic agenda for equitable growth. And here, digitization in which India has shown significant leadership can become one of the core requirements or one of the core bedrock on which this can be built going forward. From an industry perspective and from, I would call it, the usage of this digital, digital, digital journey is something which we are very much looking forward to. And as we build this consensus, that's something which we believe India can work with the Global South to make happen and deliver a solutions for the rest of the world. Third point is with regard to how do we support the transition to the various climate goals which we are speaking of, the sustainability initiatives which we are speaking of. And here, it's very important that we carry along the medium and smaller businesses as they embark on this journey of transition. Not only would we need to support them through the large corporates, but also provide the necessary funding support for the various markets in the Global South to make sure we can sustain that transition in an equitable manner and be not sacrificing growth at the same time. Finally, as one of the major outcomes which we did have was to look at how we can have the SDG financing, which you are aware, Madam Finance Minister, during the B20 summit, we had given a suggestion. We are now working forward, uh, working with the multilateral institutions, the think tanks, the policymakers, to see how we can concretize this into an action 
and make it happen at the ground level to support the global south. We look forward to working with you and with all of those who are participating today in making this event deliver outcomes and make a difference to India and the developing world going forward. We look forward to the deliberations today and going ahead. And thank you once again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dinesh. Thanks for that very quick uh, overview. Uh, I now turn to uh, Dr. Ricardo Hausman. All of you uh, have uh, gone through and seen, uh, he took us through his presentation and uh, it was really uh, very, very informative, highly, highly enriching for all of us. And I really particularly uh, wanted to applaud you for the ECI, the Economic uh, Complexity Index, uh, uh, which is, you have developed, which is indeed a very, very valuable tool, if I can say, in this scenario, allowing us uh, the exploration of global trade flows, uh, helping us to see what type of new opportunities. So it will be great to hear you once again, Dr. Hausman, and especially when our Honorable Finance Minister is also here. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, new opportunity to address you. I wanted to share a, a couple of ideas um, uh, on opportunities ahead. Uh, I mentioned in my previous talk that uh, I see India has enormous opportunity for diversification into new areas. Um, and I want to stress at this moment that I see um, a, that we are facing uh, the energy transition uh, with a framework that may not be the most useful. Uh, the way I understand the framework that is being discussed is that it's a framework that has like three chapters. One chapter is mitigation. What are you going to do to lower your emissions? A second chapter is adaptation. What are you going to do to cope with changes in climate? And the third chapter now is just transition. What are you going to do with the people who are going to lose their jobs in their transition? And these all seem like extra headaches on an already challenging development agenda. I would like to argue that if we reframe it a little bit, instead of becoming a challenge, it becomes an opportunity. And the way to do it is by noticing that we are right, right now thinking that if the world needs to lower its emissions, that means that every country needs to lower its emissions, every city needs to lower its emissions, every company needs to lower its emissions, and that we're all looking at ourselves, how is it that we are lowering our emissions? But there's a fallacy of composition here, because for the world to lower its emissions, the world is going to need many things. Right? It's need, it will need to electrify everything that can be electrified. It will need to make that electricity in clean ways. And then for to do that, it will need solar panels. It will need electric vehicles. It will need batteries. It will need to change the electrical system. It will need a lot of things, right? It will need green steel. It will need right green ammonia or whatever. So it will need a lot of stuff. Who's going to produce that? Who is going to produce the things that a decarbonizing world will demand? Presumably, if the decarbonization agenda is taken strongly, those things are going to be in rapid, rapidly increasing demand. And you want to be on the supply side of those things. Okay, so uh, ask, you know, President Kennedy, whose my, my school is named after, famously said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I'm going to paraphrase him and says, ask not what you can do to decarbonize yourself, ask what you can do to decarbonize the world. Okay, because in, in that task of decarbonizing the world is your growth opportunity, it's your growth agenda. And I would like to mention two chapters here. One chapter is to these enablers I've been mentioning, solar panels, uh, all, all this list of products. But a second chapter I think is very important and has not been adequately stressed. And that is that oil is exquisitely dense from an energy point of view. 
a kilogram of oil, a liter of oil, packs an enormous amount of energy. And as a consequence, oil and oil products are incredibly cheap to transport, incredibly cheap. I was looking at the destination of Indian oil product exports, refined product exports. India exports to Germany, to Belgium, to the US, to Togo, to South Africa, means you can transport it enormously. You don't lose competitiveness by being far away. Green energy is incredibly expensive to transport. Incredibly expensive. You can generate in a good place with good sun a megawatt hour of electricity at $20 or less. That's equivalent to $30 a barrel of oil equivalent. So we can generate solar energy at less than half the price of a barrel of oil. If you want to convert that solar energy into hydrogen, it will cost you $220 a barrel of oil equivalent. So you want to use it where it hits. And that means that in the past, energy was so easy to transport that it did not determine where energy intensive activities took place. So China, Japan, South Korea, Germany, Belgium are poor in energy and they export energy intensive products. They just bring the missing energy in. In a decarbonizing world, you will not be able to do that. It's not that Mohammed is going to go to mountains, a mountain will have to go to Mohammed. That is, you will have to move manufacturing activities to places that are rich in green energy. That's the way to decarbonize the world. And that's why it's not everybody lowering their emissions. It's you shut down over there. So we substitute for you here because we can do it in a green way. You can only do it in a gray way. And that I think is what we call strategy two. And I think that that's an enormous opportunity for those who can seize the opportunity of generating cheap, reliable energy, not just to decarbonize themselves, but to decarbonize the world, to attract manufacturing activities in that sense. And that's why I'm a big fan of green industrial parks that are going to be plug and play for companies that want access to cheap, reliable energy. They just move to a park, the ecosystem is there, the necessary infrastructure, the connection to the labor force, the logistics, et cetera, but the green energy is there in order to attract these, these industries that will have to relocate in order to, uh, uh, to, to mitigate, in order to decarbonize. I just wanted to say, because it's a theme of, of, of the meeting, uh, the digital agenda. And I think that one of the themes going forward is remote work. We have, I mean, the cost of going to work in, in developing countries is enormous relative to the daily wage, the time it takes to get to work, the cost it takes to get to work. <clears throat> with, with the COVID, we learned that things that we used to do in the office can be done from home. And then we learned that that can be done from home can be done, oops, can be done from any. This is an opportunity to incorporate uh, the, high, the increasing skilled supply of Indian willingness to work that is located all across the geography to connect them to to work digitally. And I think this can expand enormously the access of companies to talent, and it can make growth more inclusive. It's particularly important in a gender theme because the opportunity cost of mothers spending two hours going to work and two hours coming back is just enormous and a, a huge uh, disincentive. And it will be a great opportunity to formalize work by taking out one thing that has been an amazing tax on labor, which is commute costs, direct and indirect commute costs, which hurt women particularly more strongly. So, and traps them in, you know, in the language of the previous lecture and making one letter words because they cannot participate 
in organizations that, that can mix letters. So I think the digital agenda has this potential. I'm emphasizing remote work and I'm emphasizing uh, the gender component and the inclusive aspects of remote work. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hosman, for, uh, for your remarks and for really bringing out a very, very important uh, perspective. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when I was uh, welcoming and uh, really putting in our bit of appreciation for our Honorable Finance Minister, uh, you, we saw that I got, uh, if I may say, a little interrupted by a uh, very spontaneous uh, applause. Uh, uh, one could have gone on uh, to, uh, for a few minutes, actually, to talk about uh, how she has steered the economy, how she has uh, really uh, put India uh, into uh, a spot which is today so very sought after, and people do uh, people do see India as such a favoured destination. The, just the economic management, the uh, macroeconomic fundamentals, and also some of the huge policy changes that one has seen. And with that, I'd like to really uh, request all of us uh, to join me in uh, applauding and requesting the finance minister now to give the inaugural address for this for, uh, economic policy forum. Good morning and thank you very much for inviting me to share some thoughts with you. Let me start with an apology. Unbelievably this morning, traffic jam in two different points in Delhi, showing the keenness with which people are out and about. But that held me back by about 10 minutes and uh, I had to reach late here. So, apologies on that. I will start by congratulating the CII for having initiated a process which was generally talked about for some time, but which was the need of the hour. Particularly after the G20 India presidency, I think it's just the right thing to do and the thing which is so needed now because if the emerging market countries, EMEs, emerging market economies, are going to be the growth engine and the learnings from the G20 India presidency all indicate towards the need for greater discussion and a global engagement to understand where exactly the world will have to move from where we are today, at least for the next 20, 25 years. Each country can have its own agenda, its own traction of its strength and also the challenges that it has to face can all be specific to countries. But there is today, particularly today, post-COVID, post-recovery, somewhat partial, I would say, post also unexpected, not one, but three wars. The major disruptions that the world has seen. It, it has become necessary from the point of view of all voices to be heard, opinions to be churned and the global agenda be set where all the voices have been taken into consideration. The agenda can be very well ta tailored on a larger macro level at a global level but from it there should be a benefit and an inclusion of 
all countries. The inclusion of Global South, meaning the voice of the Global South heard prior to the G20 presidency by Honorable Prime Minister of India, and post that, making sure that the agenda that India presidency puts forward in the G20 would reflect the concerns of the Global South, have all shown that if there is will and if there is concerted action, if there is consensus and intent getting converted to action, then it is possible. The entry of the African Union into the G20 during India presidency showcases that the G20's will to act was there, it translated into action and therefore you saw the entry of African Union into the G20. I am indeed grateful to the entire G20 membership for having enabled that. So with this kind of a background, if thought engines will have to exist somewhere, global growth engines can be in the emerging market economies, but thought engines will also have to contribute to it. And if thought engines have to contribute, they can't be somewhere exclusive in one corner of the world where the South doesn't reach. And therefore, this attempt of the CII, particularly immediately after the G20 India presidency, and particularly after the African Union's entry into the G20, is just the right thing to do. And I'm indeed grateful, therefore, for all of you who have come over here to participate in this. It is going to be absolutely necessary to keep this momentum up, not just just one year. For the next few years, we have to persist on this job of putting forward the concerns of the Global South in both the development and development-related actions and also in those actions which are going to be global but which will have a bearing on all of us, top of the agenda being climate action. I was glad to hear Professor Ricardo Hossman speak specifically now in his brief intervention about what exactly has to happen on climate action. I heard him keenly and absolutely right that they cannot be mitigation, adaptation related discussions from the standpoint of view of how much it's going to hit me. It also has to be from the point of view of how much of opportunity lies in it for all of us. And for that, of course, there needs to be a lot of thinking, sharing of ideas and making good that those ideas don't just remain on the table where we discuss, but translate into specific action. So I would think the CII should keep this uh, as an annual calendar event, make sure that this becomes a forum for policymakers to look to and seek ideas and thoughts with which policy, which will have a positive bearing on the emerging market and economies and also the global south. There are a few thoughts I had even as um, Professor Hossman was speaking that the transitional energy, which he did not mention as a word, but I'm bringing it here, transitional energy challenge is a very big challenge. In the meanwhile, the rapidity with which we want to make ourselves green is another challenge running parallel, but both going in different speeds. Transitional energy and the cost of transitional energy is something which all of us are thinking about. The base energy requirement cannot be filled by renewable energy sources, is well known, but it is possible to think in terms of rapidly spreading the renewable energy in such a way that individual participation is ensured. India's, if I may use the word, India's success in rapidly moving in the renewable energy space, particularly through the solar, is because both the large park establishments 
and also the rooftop and the farm uh, hedge based solar panels are happening simultaneously we are not just dedicating large stretches of land barren land uh, desert land to become the solar hubs we are equally looking at small holdings of farmland which can have in their uh, boundaries solar panels small house souls have solar panels on their rooftop with the assurance given to them that over and above what they consume the rest can go to the grid and they will receive payments for it so the, there has been a lot of thought going into india's solar and renewable energy uh, execution fulfilling our norms nationally determined criteria conditions and also um, moving from one cop to another the achievements of india in the renewable energy space is because we are making it inclusive development has to be inclusive but the contribution towards these milestones will also have to be inclusive only then people realize that these are not things happening beyond them and that they have nothing to do with it when they contribute to it they also see the value that it brings to them as individuals and also as a society one of the thought which honorable prime minister modi has also been talking to a lot of countries about in the context of international solar alliance is can the world not be linked with grids running across countries and eventually touching though every part of the world which will have sunshine 24 by 7 in the sense there's always day somewhere when there is night elsewhere so there should be a global connective grid system operating so that from somewhere there is solar energy getting onto the grid which keeps flowing where it is required so life can become easier the international solar alliances approach to have a global grid connectivity about which i'm glad i have had conversation with ajay banga the world bank president to see if that can be done in parts so that eventually we are able to link it all up similarly i also have um, uh, an appreciation sense of appreciation and i would think this is worth moving forward also the global biofuel alliance biofuel is with is within the realm of every country you have your own sources of biofuel you can do it yourselves and i'm happy to say when i was the defense minister we even tried out using aviation fuel which had a component of biofuel in it and it was very big a success defense establishments were happy to see that biofuel can become effective fuel for particularly the aircrafts so there are little but significant uh, innovations happening and i think we we should move in that direction i'll expand on just one more thing because i said we should have a think engine not just a growth engine in the global south think engine also reflecting the concerns and achievements of the emerging market economies because it is the various innovative ways with which the emerging markets that have attempted to keep the economy buoyant post the covid which have made them stand out as real triggers of growth post covid and therefore it's worth picking up one or two of those achievements and benefiting from it so that the engines are truly the fast going engines which can pull the entire global growth bogies which are waiting to move forward one such a thing from india is the digital technology adoption it is one thing that the government had invested and created the infrastructure required for the digital world whether you used it for communication whether it it was being used for marketing 
whether for health and health service provision or whether it was financial technology which was being used for inclusion in the financial world. We have proved that not only our innovations work but they have been rapidly scaled up and adapted by people who live in the far-flung areas, by women, by um, semi-literate people. So India's digital achievements, which were very much showcased during the G20 presidency, stand out as an example for two things. One, for inclusion and inclusion without corruption. Because many of the emerging market worlds, that's not to say that developed countries are free of corruption in total, but emerging market and also global south need such technology driven instruments to make their economies transparent, to be well governed and to make sure everybody benefits from governance. So India's fintech revolution, which actually showcases itself through the payment revolution that is happening digitally has actually shown it is possible to have inclusion, better governance by saving money through technology. India, for instance, after having brought the direct benefit transfer to the accounts of the poor, government's money going to the accounts of the poor directly, have saved more than 2 trillion Indian rupees. 2 lakh crores of Indian rupees has been saved because no more spurious recipient of these benefits. So that makes a difference to your governance itself, brings transparency to the system and the ultimate beneficiary gets the total amount which is due to him and no pilferages happen. So if this is one side of the story, the other is the common citizen who is well away from the governance headquarters realizes that that very instrument, which gives him the benefits, also gives him the access to the global market. The way in which Prime Minister Modi has been pushing lo vocal for local, meaning be vocal about the local products, has made sure that India's poor artisans who stay in the back waters of the hinter hinterland are today able to make access to the global market and just around Deepavali, which is a big festival for India, their sales have touched about one and a half lakh crores. So it's no longer small thousand rupees or 10,000 rupees. The cumulative effect of technology reaching your doorsteps, adapted by common people because it's simpler to use, it can be used in any instrument, you don't need to have a smartphone and if the language is in the language of the user and India, I'm sure you are aware, has more than 22 languages officially declared as languages active in use. There are very many more dialects as well. So when people are able to use it in their hands, inclusion is achieved. I've been in the policy world for some time not just as a minister, but even before that. This word inclusion has been on for a very long time. But today India can stand before you with its head, head held high, saying how inclusion was brought in just by sheer nudge. The Prime Minister could stand up and speak in his first address from Red Fort saying those who are receiving subsidy for cooking gas, who don't deserve to get it, who are well above the poverty level, would they please give it up? And they did, more than a crore people gave it up. But that was immediately transferred to the poorest to the poor. Technology, similarly, just a nudge, small incentives have been adapted. So it's impacted on good governance positively. It has brought in inclusion and all the sloganeering about inclusion did not have such results. So my submission for this forum, which is meeting at a very critical time,
when the global thought process will have to be included, inclusive is such examples are better in achieving inclusion, in achieving green goals, then I'm sorry, I will take this opportunity and use this platform to say it, then a single mono-sided decision to bring in border adjustment taxes. I want to make my industry green, so I will impose on you a certain tax because you're coming up with non-green products. And with that money, I will make my industry green. The border adjustment tax logic just goes against the concern of the South, the global South. Every country will have to have resources generated to meet with the demands so that we are better adjusted to the green uh, commitments that we've made globally. But cross-border imposition and that money going towards somebody else's green agenda, if anything, if I don't sound extreme and if you will indulge me for a minute, is not moral at all. Lastly, whether it is climate, I understand you have six sessions. Very good concerns have been picked up, economic growth on which all of us are speaking. You need to have technology, you need to have innovative ways of funding your own growth. You need to make sure that you've identified sections which need that kind of help. In, in a recent discussion, Honorable Prime Minister openly said, for a complex and very diverse country like India, he said, look, I look at only four different sections of India's society. And many of you, I can see in the audience, who are not from India. You must have heard about very many uh, divisions, which are natural. They have their strength. They have their weakness. But they have been effectively used by forces who do not want India to move fast on the growth track to, to speak against whether it is caste, whether it is regional differences, whether it is uh, linguistic division, or whether it, whether it is even religious differences. Things don't help if you divide using any of these. So the Honorable Prime Minister has given, and I'm saying this today because it is necessary for us to understand that every aspect of India's growth will have to be addressed, and that is what is making delivery possible to the last person who's waiting there saying, I need some help from the government. And therefore, from the point of view of Prime Minister Modi, it was only the poorest of the poor as one group who needs immediate attention for all kinds of governmental support. The farmer, because he produces everything that which not just you, but the entire globe re requires. Look at the insecurity that the wars have brought on us, on food security matters. Total insecurity. Will I get my grain? Will there be enough food at the, on the table at home? Will the supplies come from those war-affected countries? Do we need this? So if countries do focus on their farmers, and for which, of course, the age-old fight of the global south against the WTO, for instance, for having accepted rules which are very favorable for some countries in giving assistance to their farmers, but not accepting any other country, such as the emerging market economies, to give assistance to their farmers. The globe needs food, not just India. The globe needs food, not just the Indian poor. And if only these restrictions were not on India, we would have served the world with adequate food grains, and I'm sure many other emerging markets would have also done. These are the things on which global interaction like this will have to address. So the four categories I've said, the poor, the farmer, the youth, they want a world better than what we have seen. And therefore the youth's concern will have to be heard. They will have to be given support for education, for skilling, for upskilling, and finding the right kind of environment, either to be self-employed or to find a job in, an, in a company or in some institution. And the last one, which I'm very grateful 
to the prime minister to women so the fourth category not in that order in any order women we need more women in policy making we need more women in businesses we need more women in the boardrooms we need more bo uh, women even on the shop floors today india in the rural hinterland is giving drone techniques to women supplying them with drones so that they can go to the field and undertake more healthier practices such as spraying the fertilizer on the leaves rather than enriching with pesticides the soil which is now going deep into the grounds poisoning our waters so the the, the women the drone didis as i can use this expression are the ones who are going to deliver the villages to take care of mother earth to produce more crops and be the ones who are going to be mastering the technology for maintaining and operating the drones in the villages for agricultural purposes so i i understand i have taken too much of your time but effectively the points that i want to place before you is that this institution or this arrangement should become a calendar event it should churn out thoughts for the global south and also for the rest of the world you should be the ones who set the agenda for the next 25 years so that the world moves on the right direction and doesn't fall into such uh, serious concerns as war as epidemic where we are not able to help one another or run for vaccines from one country to another and so on countries can benefit by adapting technology into policy making so thank you again professor hosman for being here and talking to us thanks cii for having taken this initiative and thanks to every one of you who have come here and uh, who would enrich this conversation and make it possible for the world to hear from you about what we need to do in the next decades thank you very much Thank you, thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Honourable uh, Finance Minister, for this uh, outstanding address, if I may say, practical yet comprehensive, informative, thought-provoking, wide-ranging, strong, and very strong and direct messages. And I think that's uh, that's the way you are, and that's the way you have uh, led the inaugural of this. Uh, of, of, of this uh, uh, very, very critical forum. Uh, I dare not to really sum up at this point in time what you said, but we'll open it up for a few questions which the Honorable Finance Minister has uh, kindly agreed to take. And I just wanted to touch upon a point which uh, Professor raised, Dr. Hosman raised, uh, about the productivity and our human capital, uh, which you spoke about, Dr. Hosman, and I'd like to really, uh, once again, uh, ask the finance minister, actually, as I've heard her many times focus on uh, health, uh, education, outcomes, and you have uh, really addressed that so very much uh, in your policies. So maybe would you like to uh, allude to that, uh, Madam Finance Minister, to this global audience? Health is something on which I think uh, there is no country left behind in talking and voicing their concern now, post-COVID. But I think the matters begin now. It is just uh, not sufficient for all of us to be talking about it. Sharing of... Uh, medicines, vaccines, establishing capacities to produce medicines so that preventive care is given priority, 
and having a fairly flexible policy so that the capacities are created first and then each country can look at how they can have a larger national angle to things. I've started in a very ambiguous way to answer this question, but what I'm trying to say is very few countries today have mastered pharmaceutical, let's say the entire cornucopia, and produce enough generic drugs which are cost effective, are not obsessed with the brand image of each of them, and who can actually be ready to share this with countries which do not have them. And above all, continue to maintain that supply till such a time the countries can have their own capacities. In my time as Commerce Minister, I remember literally speaking for the Indian pharmaceutical generic drug manufacturers so that they can establish units in countries which don't have access to generic medicines. There was a different mindset then. It, will it be our own or is it going to be Indian? Will the Indian come here and make the profit and so on? But I think post-COVID, minds have opened up. We need to have sharing of knowledge, establishing of more centers which produce affordable medicine all over the world. One. Second, movement of patients should be a lot more flexible. India is quite open about receiving patients who come from Global South, and we would want to help them with affordable medical treatments. So that is open for India and immediate, uh, um, equally, many hospitals, the big corporate hospitals from India are today willing to establish centers in countries which so need them. We are happy to open up and assist from the government with policies which will help them to do that. But most importantly, health as a priority, even for India, we have a lot more to do. We are taking it down to the district levels now, building, nurturing wellness. So that is one, we call them as Arogya Mandir, temples of health, good health. We've given them that name because people should feel that it is a place which is meant for them to go frequent and ensure that they do everything to keep wellness in mind. So it is not always promoting treatments post an injury, post a health crisis. All of us will have to lay emphasis on preventive care as well. And that is where I'm happy globally we pushed on yoga and leading a healthy life so it is not just a cultish moving on, just on the walking or running, but also keeping your overall fitness um, in mind. India promotes fitness in a big way uh, through the Fit India movement. We also are encouraging youth to take sp to sports competitive games because that is also a very good thing so that uh, they are not only spending times on social media, but also on the tracks so that their mind is lot more energetic and competitive. But there has to be a lot more give and take in terms of increasing capacities, building capacities on health and education. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Again, you have uh, really illustrated a strong leadership, again, from India. There are a few questions from the floor which, uh, which I have caught, and I'll, I'll just uh, ask some of us, for time permitting, to please uh, pose those questions. Uh, uh, may I first turn to the President of the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, uh, uh, Tetsuya Wat Watanabe. Could I have a mic here, please, Mr. Watanabe? Uh, thank you, Excellency, for the opportunity. Uh, G20 pre Presidency India has been very successful in bringing the attention of global South 
agenda to the other part of the world. Do you have any message to develop the countries like Japan, how they can co con contribute the global south in forming the, I mean, formulating a new world economic order? Thank you. I'm indeed grateful that you've asked this question. I think the global economic order will have to be reshaped, will have to be rewritten, and certainly when countries like Japan move forward on that, that itself gives it a great heft. So I'm indeed grateful that you've come up with that question. Um, there's just a lot that when Japan works together with other countries, that can be achieved. Because you have come out of your post-Second World War situation in, with such immense grit and sheer perfection with which you built up your society. That can be lesson for very many countries who are just making it up now. I think as regards global partnership, it will be just right for Japan to work together with countries, for instance, in technology-related large projects which can be done for developmental goals to be reached by countries which are in the global south. You can partner with countries which are resource-rich so that you can help them to value-add for those resources. You can partner with countries like India which have human capacities, meaning human resources, which are so technically qualified, which have experience in conducting major projects outside, you can work together with them and take the message forward and also launch major initiatives in countries, let us say in Africa, in South Asia, and also in the Pacific Islands. The island communities are also those which need help. So Japan with its historic, um, scientific, and technology master masterclass can initiate together with countries which either have major resource deposits or which are agriculturally product rich and take them forward to the rest of the world. So I'll uh, invite Japanese participation for the sense of discipline that you bring in, for the professionalism that you bring in, and also the world view you hold. I think it will be a great step forward in making the world better. Thank you. Uh, may I now turn to one of our uh, High Commissioners present here, uh, High Commissioner Wong, Singapore. The mic's there, just uh, on to your left, High Commissioner. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Honorable Finance Minister. Um, India has come out of COVID sprinting and with a very, very successful G20 presidency and a very successful B20 meetings. Um, this year alone, Singapore, I have received nearly a hundred business delegation, both Singaporean or businesses based in Singapore. Invariably, the buzzword that they have um, talking uh, amongst ourselves is upscaling of investments in India. With so many poly challenges around the world, India is seen as one of the, if not the biggest bright spot in the world. Many of them have posed the question to me to say, in two months' time, in the next budget section session in India will Honorable Finance Minister announce a supercharge budget. I know this question may move markets, but we would like to hear from you um, so that they can prepare to do the Natu Natu dance after your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... And coming from Singapore, I understand the uh, strength with which uh, this thought has been put through as a question. 
And I'm sure the audience is very familiar as to how we've had an MOU signed with Singapore on uh, real-time exchange between our uh, IFSCA center and also the Singapore Stock Exchange. And uh, the payments are also, the digital payments are also happening real-time with Singapore because their system, digital system and our system are now in a position to talk to each other. So technology has really found a very attractive groove, uh, if I may use that word, in uh, the relationship between India and Singapore. Uh, but to the point that you asked me, I'm not uh, going to play a spoiled sport, but it is a matter of truth that the 1st February 24 budget that will be announced will just be a vote on account because we are in an election mode. An election happens this, during the summer, the coming summer. So the budget that the government presents will just be able to or would just be a budget to meet with the expenditure of the government till a new government comes to play. So, and that budget following the British tradition is called voter no count. So no spectacular announcements are made at that time. So you may have to wait till after the new government comes in, in July will be the next full budget, July, 2024. So, Things have to wait till then. Great, thank you, thank you. It will be uh, two short, quick questions because we don't uh, want to go too much over time and we're holding on to the finance minister. So may I turn to Professor Mikola Jan Piskrovsky, the uh, professor on, uh, uh, from the of Asia and Digital Strategy, Analytics and Innovation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, we are a very unique business school that focuses on educating senior leaders who drive transformations of organizations worldwide, but also in India. And congratulations for uh, helping drive the growth of the Indian economy and congratulations on the impact that digital transformation has had on this huge growth. Uh, being a professor of digital strategy, of course, this is very dear to my heart. My question to you is, what would you recommend to senior leaders, CEOs, CXOs in Indian companies to do in order to accelerate digital transformation, the use of AI, uh, which will then subsequently drive growth throughout uh, the Indian economy? I'll certainly encourage him to adapt to using AI. I'll certainly encourage them to take a industrial revolution 4.0 seriously. I would want them to be sure that in their planning for short term, medium term and long term, AI and Web3 are all taken in the right spirit to improve productivity, to improve efficiencies, and to make sure that you are able to take the monotony out of due diligence. You need to have due diligence, you need to have compliances, but maybe AI will help you to do it smartly. So for all these purposes, yes, Indian executives will now have to um, give good quality time to infuse AI into their scheme of things. But more importantly, I think, if they only see the intent of our government, and if they only are able to see where the government has pitched India in getting AI, in using AI, and also having test cases worked as pilot projects in AI, we've, we've announced setting up three different centers of excellence uh, for AI. So industry can, and I invite Indian industry to work closely with us in these institutional arrangements that we are making with public funds so that AI can um, penetrate where it should genuinely penetrate and bring about changes in productivity. However, equally, I would also want them to be sure that there is a small team which will watch AI so that it is being used ethically, 
so that their companies become, um, let's say, exemplar in showcasing how AI has only helped them to ward off those which are not desirable and to play upon those which are actually good. Thank you. Last one, uh, Dr. Andre uh, Goldstein from the OECD. Thank you, and let me first of all congratulate the Honorable Minister for her achievements and those, of course, of 1.4 billion Indians uh, in steering uh, the economy as, uh, forward. And in the latest uh, issue of the OECD Economic Outlook, we show that India is the fastest growing economy in the G20. So again, this is uh, something unexpected, maybe 10 years ago, but it's very real right now. Now, uh, my question has to do with uh, uh, women, actually, they, uh, as you can see here in the cover page, we have um, women. And uh, from your perspective as a f uh, finance minister, and uh, what uh, do you think that more can be done in terms of uh, improving uh, the situation of uh, women in the workforce uh, in India in particular, of course, uh, in terms of outlays, but also in terms of the tax system? Um. Outlays and uh, taxation, we've always had one little additional benefit given to women. That's been there irrespective of governments. But now we've, we've also given them um, credit at a reasonable rate with no collaterals to be given. So when credit reaches women, where they don't have to bring in gold from the family or a house property to be pledged and so on. They carry on their business on their own, not being dependent on anybody else in the family. However, women being women, the benefits of what they do naturally accrue to the family. So we have recognized that quality. We've uh, brought in into the um, government policy that schemes which bring in certain assistance should prioritize on women. So we've extended that. We've also extended making sure that there are more women in STEM in the universities. Our uh, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, uh, stands out for the number of women who are launching rockets and sending solar missions. So if they can reach there, I'm sure they can reach the boardrooms of businesses. So the message is actually on the companies to have more women. Madam, uh, one indulgence uh, request, sorry, that uh, I, I, I is uh, uh, His Excellency Salma Rahman, the uh, private industry and investment advisor to the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. He wanted to ask a question. So I'd like to... Excellency, I'm actually very sorry, although it was announced as the last question, but I thought I'll, I, I won't have this opportunity to uh, ask you something which is, I think, uh, important for the Global South. And as you know, after the Ukraine war, because of the strengthening of the US dollar and the rise in interest rates by the Federal Reserve, the reserves of Bangladesh were very badly affected. And then with India, we had this bilateral agreement to do our trade in rupee. But I think this is a problem uh, for the entire global south. And uh, although, and I would like your views that because there is so much within the trade of the global south, there is so much trade imbalance, whether we can find a currency which can be an alternative to the US dollar. And how do we go about that? Because I think this is something which is very important for the economies of the global south and the emerging markets in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, it is certainly a very uh, sensitive and a very is issue of concern for many countries, particularly in the global south. We have actually uh, facilitated very many countries in engaging with India using the rupee, because rupee at least has been very stable against most currencies, particularly against the US dollar, globally revealed data shows that the Indian rupee has held, its up, uh, held itself up strongly against the dollar. The dollar's uh, 
uh, increase in its uh, value may have gone up and gone up disproportionately much more than many other currencies. But if any currency has stood the pressure, it's been Indian rupee. And uh, therefore, we have, at least in South Asia uh, and uh, some countries in uh, Africa, already started the process of having rupee trade. With Russia, of course, we've had a rupee trade of sorts earlier. Now we have a different kind of mechanism through which we are facilitating rupee trade. I can see uh, officers of the External Affairs Ministry who are here. This is something we are actively promoting and taking it forward. But on the larger issue of which currency will it be, if not the US dollar, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, discussion, thought process, which have to be taking out their own time, their own discussions. And it's going to be not an immediate thing that, that we can talk in detail about. It's a thought there. It's floating around. We'll have to see how that's going to work out. Thank you. Thank you.